Kevin wrote three books, the 1995 Business Week bestseller, Mega Media Shakeout, the critically acclaimed The Maverick and His Machine, Thomas Watson Sr., and The Making of IBM, published in 2003, and the brand new trade-off, Why Some Things Catch On and Others Don't, with a foreword written by Jim Collins. Don't forget to pick up your copy tonight. He is also a musician and a songwriter. Last year, Kevin released a CD called Privacy by Kevin Maney and his briefs. And from my understanding, Kevin, it can be downloaded on iTunes. <laughs> Kevin, we're glad to have you here tonight. Everyone, please welcome Kevin Maney. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks to Karen and the Churchill Club. And I just wanted to say that I thought that um, I think that all the channels on, on YouTube are nonprofit. Aren't they? <laughs> and uh, boy, is this me? It's my. It's, it's, you're hearing my incredibly dark soul. Is <laughs> the thing is, what's happening? Um, <laughs> and we are. And we are. You know, for a Silicon Valley panel, we are incredibly well dressed, aren't we? We are. This is. Yeah, we all <laughs> dressed up for you guys. Exactly. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why. Um, uh, so next to me here is, is Trip Hawkins, is the uh, CEO of Digital Chocolate founder of Electronic Arts, over here at Zach Nelson, who's the CEO of NetSuite, and uh, um, before that worked for Oracle for years, and, um, and what, what they actually have in common is, um, is me. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't know each other before this, this evening, but um, for years, these two guys are two people that I've talked to um, you know, over lunches and dinners and just appointments, and um, often talk to them about, not just about their companies, but about big ideas and how they think about things in, in the technology world. And, um, and I ended up doing a lot of um, uh, you know, thinking about some of their ideas and others that, I, that I'd heard and, and put them together into this, um, into this book that was just out called, called Trade-Off uh, about the way that people uh, constantly are willing to trade the, um, the quality of an experience for, uh, you know, for the convenience of getting it and vice versa, do something that's more convenient that might be less quality or higher quality if it's less convenient, and how that tended to actually inform the thinking of a lot of people in, that I'd run into in Silicon Valley and technology across the, across the world, including these two guys in different ways. Um, and so we got talking about a way to have a discussion that you know, was something around, somewhat around that, but also around the way they think um, and, and how that's um, informed their business decisions over time. And uh, I want to actually start with, you know, with, with Trip. Because um, I, 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 one of the things that really in, you know affected me at one point in this in this sort of big, you know, um, idea realm um, was when we first first heard about digital chocolate. First, he first told me about about it and about why he got into it. And um, I'm going to let him elaborate. But you know, my take or the what you know, sort of led me to some of these these other conclusions um, was when he started talking about how. The, uh, in the early days, trying to force video games that were built for television or built for computer screens onto these little screens of cell phones was a trade-off that people were not willing to make and that, that um, the, the cell phone device makers and the service providers were fundamentally misunderstanding what was going to work and what the power of these cell phones were, which was a social experience, not a screen experience. Um, and he set out to make essentially what were really better fidelity games for cell phones because they took advantage of what cell phones were instead of t trying to force something that didn't work onto cell phones. So I, that's my you know, brief takeaway, but what I wanted to ask Tripp to do is to talk a little bit about um, that thinking that went into digital chocolate in the first place and how it may or may not fit this, I you know, this idea of the way people make, make trade-offs in their buying decisions. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that we've all experienced in the last five, 10 years is that uh, you know, five or 10 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of usage of uh, digital media by consumers, period. You know, you'd have these markets like the PlayStation where you'd have 100 million hardcore customers and the rest of the public was saying, oh, yeah, I'm not a gamer. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, it, it had your, your first 100 million that would get something like the iPod or 100 million that would get a Game Boy. And even, even the number of PCs that were considered home computers used by a family really more as a consumer product, maybe that was only 100 million. So fairly small audience. <clears throat> Everybody else is kind of circling around, aware that it's going on, but not really diving in. And uh, for, for a lot of consumers, the first computer they, they got was their mobile phone. 
and we, were, we went through a sort of tipping, tipping model where everything went where very rapidly from analog phones to digital. Speaking of phones. <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the quarter. I've got to approve this deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it off now. Sorry, Trip. <laughs> so, you know, when, when digital chocolate got started, we thought, well, everybody's going to have one of these. And obviously, they're going to have very different expectations about what they're going to do with it. Why, why do people have a mobile phone? And it was very clear that it was going to be a very convenient computer because it was always going to be with you. And that people were carrying it mainly because they wanted to be connected. So the, the fundamental point of it was, was social. <clears throat> and I think this is the thing about, uh, about fidelity is that people will, people will give up a lot uh, if something becomes more convenient. And I think, I think particularly when you get to digital electronics and uh, products and services, they're often interactive. And because they're interactive, it expects something from the customer in terms of how to operate it. Mm -hmm. And you know, most people aren't going to have an appetite for getting in really deep up to their elbows, learning how to do these things. So you know, it's one thing to maybe appreciate a, uh, a film in a movie theater where you, where you just have to show up and watch it. Although it, I think a lot of people find it increasingly inconvenient to even do that. To go to a theater. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's a lot worse if you're talking about something interactive like a video game. And so most consumers say, yeah, you know, I don't really want to have to look like an idiot because I can't, I can't handle it. So th th I think that's one of the ironies about uh, this whole wave of digital media is that things are much simpler to operate. And they're also much more convenient because they're simpler and they're on platforms that are, that are fundamentally more convenient. And the adoption rates are spectacular. So now we have well over a billion people that are involved in consumer digital media behaviors, including texting and browsing and email and searches and sharing photos and joining social networks and playing this whole new category of uh, casual games and social games that's emerged. And what, what, you know, just to <clears throat> give everybody a little back, more background, when you first went into digital chocolate, everybody was trying to force, like uh, Nokia was making like the N-Gage and trying to put Tiger Woods Golf on a tiny little screen the size of you know this. <laughs> And, and you said, no, you got to do something like Avo Peeps. And you might want to tell people about like, what the, yeah, well, so those the, things the were. Example and, and the the customer ones. that wants to play Grand Theft Auto, they're not going to be satisfied doing that on a dicky little phone because the brand experience and the attribute values of that brand have a lot to do with the fidelity of the experience. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> it can't be the same brand when you cram it down onto a dinky little display on a slow network. Uh, the flip side is that all of the other consumers that might be interested in doing something with that mobile phone, well, they're not fans of Grand Theft Auto. So there was just an impedance mismatch there. Right, right. And there, there was obviously more of an opportunity to figure, well, who are all these people and what would they like to do? And that's, that's how you end up with things like Twitter, or, or even for that matter, SMS. Uh, you know, SMS was originally uh, invented by the technicians as a way of testing the network. They didn't even figure that it was a consumer service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, don't, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, uh, it spread virally, you know. So it wasn't one of these things where the industry went out and promoted it like crazy. Oh, this is going to be great. Everybody's going to do it. It's going to be a hundred billion dollar year industry. That's not how it happened. What happened is that people started receiving them, and eventually they figured out they were trained how to reply to them, and, and everybody got hooked on it. And it, it was a classic example of something that spread virally. And when you look at it, how could how could texting succeed? How how could you get people to triple tap? How could you live within the confines of 160 uh, characters? But you know, clearly, you, you got this enormous audience. Uh, they can get some social benefit out of it. And it's simple enough, and it's convenient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let me, let's come back to that in a second and, and, get, and introduce Zach. Um, and so Zach is, again, somebody I've known for a very long time. And, um, and at one point, early in NetSuite days, we had a dinner at some like farmhouse in Virginia or something. I, we were bringing that up the other day. <laughs> Um, and um, and he's he's you know, telling me about this idea of you know you got all these monster enterprise apps that cost a lot and are difficult to implement maybe do a lot for your company um, but uh, you know have to, to sit on these big computers and and our mess and um, and why not offer a a much more convenient version of that which is what it seems to me that NetSuite has done um, by making it something you could tap into as you needed it and um, and in a much more easy way but. I'd love to hear about your thinking about how you got into that and how that made sense to you. Yeah, so I, some of the parallels, I think, with what Trip talked about, just with software as service in general, when the first instantiations of software as a service came, they were the old applications trying to be delivered the new way, right? The internet was the new platform and the new phone and your model. So 
was trying to do the exact same thing. Corio and those guys, they'd take people soft and they'd host all these applications and say, now you can access them from the internet. And that, that approach failed. Um, and I don't know if it was, it was more convenient, but the fidelity must not have been there, perhaps, in, in your parlance. I think if you look more broadly, really, at the whole application landscape in the context of these notions of convenience and fidelity, it's amazing anybody ever bought a business application because they are neither convenient nor high fidelity. You know, <laughs> They're very difficult to use, very difficult to manage, and you still get really lousy data out of them. <laughs> right? So whatever was happening before business apps were invented must have been really bad, uh, given the state that most companies run their, <laughs> run their business in for somehow uh, those, you know, the great planes of the world and the SAPs of the world to take over. So um, when I, I got into the software and service business very early, my last job at, between Oracle and NetSuite was at McAfee, and my last job there was to take our products and turn those into services. So in 1999 and 2000, we did McAfee.com, which was a B2C version, taking McAfee's products and delivering them as an ASP. But they were, it was really a, a brand new application set. And then MyCIO.com was the B2C version of that. And so I saw very quickly that this was a much better way for customers to consume uh, applications because of the convenience. And oh, by the way, it was also a much easier way for companies like ours to develop software because we could get functionality to them much more quickly and much more efficiently. So I thought it would be the future of software. And as did most of the world back in 1998 and 1999 when software as a service first appeared on the scene as ASPs. And so as you remember, there was a lot of hype in 2000 about it, and then it all crashed. Mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't until five or six years later that the applications actually took back. And so what I view that as was Consumers immediately knew this was going to be a much more convenient way to get applications delivered to them, right? Open a browser and run your business. Um, they knew how much money they were wasting managing these applications. So the convenience alone should have driven it. However, when they opened their browser to attach to the first, first version of NetSuite or the first version of Salesforce.com, the applications didn't do anything, <laughs> right? So they had no fidelity uh -huh. in your parlance, right? They didn't solve any business problems. So I think the tipping point for software as a service really came when the applications became rich enough to actually solve complex business problems. And if you look across the landscape of, of software as service products, some applications are simpler to build than others. You know, a Salesforce automation application is really easy. Enter a contact, enter a forecast, you're pretty much done. So you saw some early trajectory in, in those segments and other sort of forms-based applications. What we do is pretty complicated. We've built an application designed to run a business end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. So we naturally, that took longer to build the back office functionality and then the front office functionality and the e-commerce functionality. So we started with very small companies initially because the functionality only met their needs. But now, 10 years later, we've replaced SAP and a whole host of much higher-end solutions because of the fidelity, the depth of functionality. So our battle always becomes initially a feature function battle. If the customer needs multi-company consolidation and we don't have it, they're not going to buy our product. They don't care if the bits come from Mars or if I hand deliver them and make it very convenient for them to use it. So, um, but when we do solve their problem, suddenly the convenience factor becomes a massive selling point that puts, puts them over the top. So, um, and I still think this complex business applications, having read your book, to me still seem to be driven largely by the business problem they're solving more so than the convenience. Now, obviously, they're much more convenient. Do, do, you have, well. do you have to resist? Um, you, you just mentioned the you know feature, you know sets and things. Uh, do you do you have, find you have to resist trying to do build everything into those things because it would it would it be uh, too um, cumbersome as, uh, to you know deliver in a good way? Well, it's interesting. One of the most important things I think we had to do, and we learned this very early on because we were using the application to run our own business, was that we had to customize the application even for us to be successful with it. So very early on, we knew we had to make it easy, convenient to customize this because there's no way, if we couldn't even anticipate our own needs, how could we anticipate the needs of a company we had no idea how to run, a manufacturing company or something. So to me, actually, and that customization, much as you were talking about sort of the serendipity around uh, SMS taking off virally, I think customization actually has become the killer feature in software as a service applications for a couple of reasons. One is these applications are far more customizable, far more convenient to customize than traditional applications ever were. Modern technologies, a normal human can do it, you don't have to program it, all these things. And secondly, and most importantly, the biggest problem with traditional applications is version lock. Once you've customized it, it's terribly inconvenient to upgrade. Right, right? right. You cannot change the software. Because we upgrade this, because we were managing the software, number one, and because we upgrade the software all the time, 
if we lost every one of our customers' customizations every time we touched that application, we would have been out of business 10 years ago. So we had to build at the center of our architecture a rich customization architecture that enabled customizations to migrate. So that business requirement ultimately, I think, has become the winning argument for why these applications will win. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so, you know, Trip and um, Zach is talking a little about, to the, the tipping point of what actually took software as a service into something that, that actually worked. And you, with social gaming, you were there pretty early, and it wasn't working. I mean, consumers were getting it in some places, but you we were just talking a little, a little while ago that it's just been in, within fairly recent times that there's been a real tipping point in it. What drove that, and what's changed? Yeah, I think one of the things that happened is that uh, Docomo uh, in Japan, 10 years ago, they launched iMode. And they did a lot of things correctly, and the market took off and became really big really quickly. And, and the web very quickly in Japan moved from the PC to mobile devices. In fact, it's been true for several years that there's more email sent in Japan from mobile devices than from PCs. And in Korea, they just copied exactly what the Japanese had done. And so kaboom, it went really big in Korea. In fact, uh, on a per capita basis, other basis, there's probably more hardcore gamers playing games in Korea than any other country in the world. Uh, it's the most advanced country <clears throat> consumption of things like virtual items. And things like microtransactions, which are kind of a brand new buzzword around here, they've been doing that in Korea for years. Uh, oddly enough, in the rest of the world, they did not adopt that formula. And so the mobile market kind of struggled and did not, did not end up acting like the web for a very long time. So we were kind of beating our heads against a brick wall trying to force the earlier generation of mobile to be like the web. And we, we eventually solved that problem by just just going to the web. You know, we went to the web on the PC and had kind of a breakthrough. And you know, in less than a year, we had over 100 million free gameplay sessions of our games that were adopted and played by consumers, even with no marketing effort. You know, and when so, you say on the web, where have you gone? Just on your so basically, we, we took some of our games, we made free versions of them, seeded them on some uh, gaming sites on the PC on the web, mm -hmm. and enabled people to pick them up and drop them on other sites. And they just on their own. The next thing we knew, they were in like 5,000 different websites. And, People are playing like crazy, and big companies are calling us saying, hey, can we get that game on our website? And so it obviously you know, created a tremendous amount of awareness. So it, again, that's back to the argument of uh, convenience, because we're talking about games that people can play in a browser. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, they've, and there's, and, you know, even, even in your uh, uh, client's business, go do, go do a study of how many features the desktop users are actually using, and it'll come right back to the convenience mm -hmm. argument, because right. they're, they're going to do the bare minimum features that they can remember from day to day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, you know that's the way a lot of us use a word processor. It's like uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll I'll use Windows until I can't figure something out and then I'm a wimp and <laughs> I go find my IT guy. <laughs> uh -huh. And then he makes me feel really stupid when I I realize how silly it was and I could have figured it out for myself. But you know for for a lot of people that can't just go hit on somebody, uh, they they're kind of on their own. So they're they're going to limit the feature set to what they can remember day to day. And I think that's one of the great things about the browser and what a big breakthrough it represents is when, when somebody like YouTube said, hey, look, uh, you're not going to have to install a video player. You don't even have to understand what the concept is of what it means to install something or worry about phishing and spyware and uh, fraud or whatever else might happen uh, or viruses. You know, just look at something that looks worse because the video is just in the browser and flash, yeah. but it was good enough. And suddenly everybody's doing it, and it becomes a form of user-generated content because you can send your friend a link, and they can just click on it, and it just works. And that's just not to be underestimated. These, these aspects where the consumers or the users get to define the experience. In your case, you're talking about customization. Right. Uh, you know, again, that's a, that's a component of social involvement, too. Yep. We're talking um, along those lines. One of the things that's, that I was writing about in the book was, um, and that I'd done some you know, stories in, in the mag and for Portfolio magazine about was, was Juiced versus Hulu, which was a classic example of that. I mean, Juiced had all of the um, early publicity and early momentum in, in terms of bringing broadcast television to the, um, the desktop or, and, and laptop screen, um, but they had this software plugins that, you know, were not easy to use, not easy to configure, and uh, they never got over that hump and, and uh, really were able to reach a mass market because it was just you know, inconvenient for most people to, to do. And then Hulu came along and said, we're just going to put it all in the browser and make it simple. And you know, Hulu's been the one that's just, just taken off like wildfire. So it does, it does seem to be a, a component that's just about, you know, if, you, you gotta, if you're going to be that kind of convenience play, I mean, you've got to make it extremely simple and extremely 
easy for anybody to do. Yeah, I think, I think this is actually, this is going to sound really simple, but I actually think it's, it's an amazing thing. So a lot of people have had a lot of years of experience pushing buttons on an ATM, mm -hmm. and then they start pushing buttons on a mouse, and, and then something like the iPhone comes out, and it's got a bunch of colored, uh, colorful icons on it. And people actually now finally are comfortable enough, they go, oh, let's touch that and see what it does. <laughs> They're not afraid of that anymore. They used to be terrified. In fact, uh, in the early days of the ATM, they'd put the ATM out there, and then they'd get reports back that nobody was using it. they say, why is nobody using it? And they'd find that, well, little old ladies are getting their fingers burned. <laughs> why is that? Well, here's where the ATM is, and they go, oh my God, it's on the southern side of the building. It's getting the sun all day long. <laughs> With the surface, is a metal that gets too hot. I mean, we're frying people. So they had to go through this learning curve. And you know, people have had this phobia about computers that's been well justified for a long time. So it's just an amazing thing about the iPhone that here's this experience where it's got a bunch of colored dots on it, and you just touch one of these colored dots, and then something happens, and people start swiping the screen, and something else happens, and you feel powerful, and you're getting your, your uh, it, you know, uh, dopamine transmitter starts firing, and you get this positive sensation, you want to and, more and buttons. you want to touch more buttons, and then you figure out that one of the buttons allows you to get more buttons, you know? and everybody wants to do it. But if it wasn't that brain dead simple, yeah. and it wasn't leaning on 100 million people with 10 years of experience with the iPod, uh, yeah. and a couple billion people with years of experience right. with ATMs and hanging around computers, it wouldn't have happened so fast. Yeah. Has, I, I don't know, Zach, has the iPhone um, and, and that sort of direction been anything that NetSuite can take advantage of? Well, yeah, we just actually released NetSuite on the iPhone. So now you yeah. have an ERP application, shockingly, on the, on an iPhone. On the yeah. iPhone. And that's the most, I mean, most amazing thing to me about Apple is that they really haven't gone after the corporate market when they have these rich, convenient applications that they can, that was always the death knell for them in the corporate world is they didn't have any applications. Now you have these far more rich and far more convenient applications than they've ever had before. So, um, so yeah, we have a little icon there, and it's uh, the customers. Vault, you know, thousands of customers have downloaded it, and you know they're raving about it. Our challenge, I think, is is a bit of a different one. I think the the ultimate test for your theory is sort of looking at our customer base, and that is, we built an application to run a business. So within a business, there are lots of different types of users. Right, there's the brain dead sales user, or not brain dead. They, <laughs> they like things to be very simple and do lots of training, sell lots of stuff. You know, there's my CFO whose dashboard, if you saw it, basically is from here to here and everything in between. So the real question is some people want it very convenient, right? I just want to enter a contact, enter an opportunity, and be gone. And some people want it high fidelity. I want to see everything that's going on in my business. And so Certainly you can customize that as an individual or as an administrator, but it's very hard to deliver the exact right experience from an app, for an application like us out of the box to each user type, unless you, unless you really go deeply in verticals. Mm -hmm. right? You really understand the customer's business, so you can say, this is the business process of an accounts receivable clerk in a wholesale distribution environment. And I think, I think ultimately that's where you know, the, the ultimate business fidelity convenience map happens in, e in our kind of software when you get into verticalization of these complete applications designed around the process of a, of a business. So, um, so that's the thing that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis is how do you make it simple, simple enough for you know, the front desk person and then rich enough from a UI standpoint mm -hmm. for your CFO. And, and, and in a different way, you probably have that with video games. Yeah, I think it's true. And, and how yeah. do you can think of the hardcore games as a vertical market, right? Right, right. I have to uh, ask you a very specific question because um, uh, that's something I wrote about recently for Fast Company was um, was on live, um, and I don't know how, if you're much familiar with them. I'd love to hear just even what you because we're speaking of delivering these kinds of things in maybe more convenient ways. Um, on live is a new company trying to deliver super high end video games of streaming essentially, you know, through mm -hmm. the through over the internet. Uh, I'd love to know what you think yeah, about I, their I, prospects. How many of you have heard of this thing? Yeah, I, I don't know about the rest of you. I really struggle with it because, uh, you know, one of my first computer experiences was, was doing batch cards on an IBM 360 and really living in the timeshare world with centralized computing power and then spending pretty much my entire adult life <laughs> explaining to people why you want to distribute it, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and it, well, wait a minute, now somehow it's going to be better to centralize it. And I, and I keep thinking about what it's like using the pay-per-view system on the hotel set-top box. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Which, which is, that's how that works, right? And they have a centralized digital system, and then they're feeding out these analog, analog signals that are terrible. And you hit a button, and seconds go by before the screen does anything. You know? 
Uh, so I, I, what I can't get my head around is compute power is compute power. And if it takes so much compute power to calculate and draw a frame of graphics, is it really going to make a big difference if it's happening over here or happening over there? Uh, it's got to go over a network. I'd rather not overburden the network no matter what. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I just have a hard time with it. So to me, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll plead ignorance, uh, but it just feels like a science fair project. Uh -huh. It's a damn fine science fair project, though. Yeah, yeah. And, know, they, and, they, and maybe I'm just dead wrong. Maybe it turns out that there's an incredible efficiency argument around it, uh, but I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah. But I can understand why some people would, because some people are just fascinated with problems like that. <laughs> yeah, and I guess it's a big latency. That's the big, uh, the big challenge there. Um, one thing that uh, um, that you, know, you and I have talked a lot about, and actually be interested in, if it has actually any relevance at all in your world, Zach, is um, it is how much the social aspect of uh, of something can actually you know add to its its stickability, its like its likability by you know uh, the the public out there. Um, you know, you've talked to me about the difference between in your head between um, watching X number of ten, you know ten million whatever is twenty million people play buy and play Madden football versus two hundred million people willing to play. The very you know low fidelity um, fantasy football, which is really about people interacting with each other and not so much this on, on screen experience, um, that if you add the social factor somehow to th the things that you are selling, that people really you know glom onto them in, in a whole new way. And, and I'd like to ask both of you about that. I mean, it's you've applied that to the things that you're doing, and if it has any. Effect, impact at all on the things that, you know, that, that you're doing, Zach. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the important thing to appreciate about the social dimension as it relates to media is that, so, so most of us uh, have the experience with media that it's something we do privately. You know, you read, you watch, you listen. Uh, so to a degree, you are, it's a form of escapism. You're in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, you're experiencing it somewhat privately. It's that uh, you escape and you check out. Right. And what's happening, in, I think, in the last 10, 20 years is more and more people realizing that they're too checked out. <laughs> and a lot of the things that historically provided social value in human civilization have declined. You know, we used to live in a little village, and you saw your same friends and family members every day. <laughs> Didn't have to think about your social life very much, and now you're commuting in a car by yourself, and you're watching TV at home by yourself, and you don't hear your neighbors. You're either part of the suburban sprawl or some high rise, and it's dangerous to go out at night. I mean. It's a different world. And you know, so whether, whether social value emerges in the form of coffee in a Starbucks mm -hmm. or it comes through a social network like Facebook, I mean, there's been a, a very high <clears throat> adoption rate, no matter what form in which it's gotten expressed. So of course, mobile phones are the epitome of this. I mean, the idea that, hey, I can actually be connected to everybody and connected to this network. And the interesting thing about spending is you look at all of the traditional forms of entertainment media where it's kind of a packaged experience and you're gonna pay a fee and you're gonna consume it and there's no kind of durable value there. It's somewhat disposable. You, know, you look at the spending levels on those and then you go over to things that are network media and social media where you're a member of the network. You may not even actually have a, a meter running. You're just, you're just paying a lot more just for permission mm -hmm. to have the network there. And it's delivering some kind of social value for you. And, uh, and the funny thing is that in every single one of those cases, the public spends 10 times more money than in the other cases. So cl clearly, people have figured out that the social value is extremely important. You can't really live without it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the best single example of this is uh, Robert Putney, who wrote this book, Bowling Alone. And he triangulated in these studies. And he found that, that if you are um, a cigarette smoker, you are more likely to die, newsflash. Uh, and you can stop smoking, and you will cut your mortality rate, your risk of death. You'll cut it in half if you stop smoking. We all now accept and believe that, right? Now, 50 years ago, we didn't. And now I'm going to tell you something that you'll have a hard time accepting. In fact, you're going to laugh. But if you're not a member of a club and you join a club, there are scientific studies that prove that you will also reduce your risk of death in half. And so you could be a smoker and just join a club, a club and, <laughs> and create smoke. a health benefit, I told you you would laugh, comparable to if you stop smoking. And that's just, un it's so unbelievable that we have to laugh. But what we're beginning to catch on to is that, in fact, your social life drives your emotional life, and that drives your biological performance. And there's increasingly studies that are finding numerous uh, examples of this. So people are just intuitively 
grasping that. And that's why they all desperately want that mobile phone, and they desperately want to be doing things with it that are connecting with other people. So does it make sense to try to build a social value into something even like business applications? On and I, I think, you know, Tripp's preamble was pretty depressing about watching TV alone and driving alone and <laughs> giving alone. And, um, and, and I tend to agree with that. But my other feeling, I think in many ways, and this I might just be one of those lonely guys Tripp was describing, but uh, the company has become the common social unit. I mean, you spend more time at work, or at least I do, than I do at home. And I think most of our employees do. And so I think social activity really operates on three levels in a in, inside of a company, inside that social unit. One is the company itself. And I think applications, at least the way we run our business on NetSuite, br draw our company together. Everybody knows what's going on in the company, right? I mean, you can get incredible data on that. Everybody knows this customer, that customer, and it's sort of a bonding area. Other people basically can see how they're contributing to the, customer, the company's success. All of those things on their dashboard. So it becomes sort of a unifying um, tenant for how we run the business. And more importantly, because as the company, as most companies begin to build distributed organizations, we have more employees outside the U.S. and inside the U.S. That suddenly ties us to them as well. So um, how you run the business technically, I think, is a very important physical anchor for the entire social fabric of the company. The, the second aspect of social networking, I think that's going to be important in business apps, uh, is the fact that when you're running a warehouse, on NetSuite, you'd probably like to meet other guys running warehouses on NetSuite. Not necessarily to talk about NetSuite, but to talk about running warehouses. Right. So I really believe social media is going to move into business, but it's going to be moving in on a role. I'm a CEO. I want to talk to other CEOs. Jim's a CFO. He wants to talk to other CFOs. John's a warehouse guy. He wants to talk to other warehouse guys. So what we're trying to do is figure out how to integrate role-based social media within the application to connect all the guys who have a warehouse role together so they can talk about how to be more efficient in the warehouse and move product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you, you, think that you think that's more important than having, say, uh, an enterprise Twitter, you know, kind of thing? Uh, well, you, you, you have that, but I think, you know, people just want to, you know, when you're at work, you want to do your job the best you can, and the more data you can get on how to do your work job the best you can and how you can advance more quickly, you're pretty darn interested in that. And you speak the same language, yeah. too, right? If I Twitter something, it's not probably going to be a very little interest to a guy who Twitters about warehouse management or whatever, but it's going to be very interesting to those guys. So I think, I think the role becomes very central to, to social media. And the third thing, and this is something we're actually implementing as well, you know, we have 66, and I don't mean to talk about NetSuite, but this is, I just, you know, I live at work, so I have nothing else to talk about. So, <laughs> but this is, just by, this is just by way of example. Um, you know, we have 6,600 companies using NetSuite. We have an incredible database of aggregate data about all those companies. Mm -hmm. So why don't we set, take out all the data about wholesalers and distributors and say, you're a wholesaler and distributor, here's how you compare, your, KPI, your KPIs compare to the entire universe of wholesaler distributors within NetSuite. So suddenly, you get this feedback loop, not just about how you're doing, but how that really matches up to your company in an aggregate way, your competitors and other things. So this notion of aggregating real business data, I think, is the third aspect of social media that will play a role in business applications. Mm -hmm. yeah, OK. Um, the, uh, um, I, I'd like, I, I, if, you, if I can throw out a few things that are, um, you know, interesting topics in you know, technology right now and some things that people are talking about a lot and ask just in the realm of what we're talking about what your thoughts might be about, um, you know, about where they stand and what's, what's going to happen with them. Um, and you know, one is the, 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 the Kindle is a much talked about product right now. Um, and uh, you know, and, and through, through the lenses you guys see those things, I'd love to know like, what, what do you think about the Kindle and where does it, is it a, mass market product, is it something that's going to just be a forerunner of something else and fade away? It, you know, it's funny, uh, I'm, I'm an uh, extremely avid uh, iPhone user. There's one in my pocket right now. But uh, I would never use a Kindle. And <laughs> it's not convenient enough. So, and, and I'm an extremely avid reader. Re reading is probably my favorite media activity. Uh -huh. And I go through, I don't know, gosh, probably 100 books a year. I mean, I just crank out books. I think uh, paperback. It's just way more convenient. And another uh, uh, kind of brutal example of this is uh, I'm in a Bible study group, and one of the guys showed up one night with a Kindle. Uh -huh. And we'd say, okay, we're going to read this now. And everybody's you know, th thumbing through their Bible to get to the right page. And he could never get there as fast <laughs> as everybody else doing it by hand. And after that, he just chucked that thing over his shoulder and got rid of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, it's an admirable idea. I, I, it's just—it's obviously not fast enough or refined enough. It doesn't—it just doesn't have the required level of convenience. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think. 
Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. For me, I'm more of a single device guy. I don't like carrying multiple gadgets. I mean, I do carry my BlackBerry and my PC, but that's about all I can deal with. If I had to carry another electronic device in my bag, I think I'd go crazy. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that could be a generational thing, too. So. Yeah. Um, another one. Um, yeah, Microsoft's coming out with Windows Seven soon. I mean, they're resorting to getting people to have Tupperware parties to, you know, essentially get the word out about uh, about it. Um, you know, what's yeah, you know, what, what's the fate there? What's happening with uh, your operating systems and, you know, and you can do all these things through the browser? Well, I, you know, I, I believed in Larry Ellison's vision back in 1996 about the network computer. You know, you basically connect this device to the cloud and get your services, and it was way early, and that's about where we're at. So I thought Vista would have been the last great Windows operating system mm -hmm. introduction. And so I, I just think the day of... Sorry about this, Microsoft folks, but um, <laughs> I think the days of these I'll giant be smiling, behemoth sorry. operating systems are done. You know, the minute, in my view, the minute Outlook moves to the cloud, the operating system moves off the desktop. I actually think Outlook's the pivotal thing that's keeping the operating system in business. And mm -hmm. So I think that's the interesting decision Microsoft has to make is how quickly they move Exchange to the cloud. Because once you move Outlook off the desktop, why do you need that stuff? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, at least in the mobile space, uh, where, where we're very active, uh, there's a lot of the members of the industry that actually prefer things to be fragmented. You know, they don't really want there to be a, a standard operating system. And of course, there are plenty of uh, good choices, and you know, a lot of different companies have good reasons for picking, you know, uh, uh, mobile Linux or Android or whatever it is that they're picking. And uh, we don't really care, and uh, I don't think the customer really cares. You know, they, they, want, they want to get to what they're trying to do quickly. They don't want to have to uh, wait and go through an intermediate layer. And, and I think that's uh, you know, part, of, part of the uh, brilliance of the iPhone design is that you don't feel like there is such a layer. You know, it's just, these are my buttons. Mm -hmm. and what, yeah, it just it, in terms of the video game industry, um, it, what are the next things? Or there's, is there going to be a next great, um, uh, you know, um, well, you know, the, 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 the trade-off, the uh, this is a classic thing that's happening in the, in the traditional game industry. So yeah, have, uh, well, how many of you uh, have ever played a hardcore console game? Any console gamers here? We've got a few. So you guys will relate to this. So all the hardcore gamers got a PlayStation when the PlayStation came out. Right. And everybody was on the same game machine playing the same games. And that pretty much comprised all of the game industry revenue. Okay, well, those customers invited their friends over to play. And they just beat the heck out of them. And then the PS2 came out, and it was an even better machine, so they went and got that. And they invited their friends over, and the friends said, I'll just watch. Mm -hmm. So then the PlayStation 3 came out. And the same customer said, I'm getting Guitar Hero. <laughs> I'm going to get a Wii. So they, they, for themselves, decided that they should dumb the fidelity down in order to attract their friends back in. And so a step away from that sort of hardcore immersive experience that they could have happily had in their basement for hundreds of hours by themselves, and they wanted to get more socially engaged. And that industry is having a very, very bad year. So their, their revenues in the last three, four months have been down like 30% from the same month uh, a year ago. But those numbers actually include the Wii and Guitar, which are the hottest things in that sector. So just imagine what their numbers would look like if you took Guitar Hero and the Wii out of it. Mm -hmm. So this, this is kind of a wholesale move where, uh, and again, it comes back to convenience because even that hardcore gamer is pressed for time. You know, everybody's increasingly busy. That's, that's clearly a characteristic of advanced society, and you're, you're just trying to get more stuff done. And that's why uh, people prefer email because it's faster than a real meeting or a real conversation. You know, there's, there's just all kinds of things we all do now, whether it's... Uh, uh, you know, m mobile, mobile uh, phone calls while you're in the car or uh, texting or, or whatever that just are shrinking mm -hmm. the size or the, 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 si the amount of information getting conveyed and this, <laughs> the time it takes to convey it and eliminating all the social niceties that chew up all that time when you have to say hello and goodbye and be nice to everybody. <laughs> and, you know, let's get the deal done. You know, right. it's like he got his deal done, right? He did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One text message you were. Yes. It was, yeah. Why? I didn't even say yes. Why? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> that was that. that was your but anyway, anyway, uh, you know, as, as far as uh, the, the kind of games that we make, you know, we're we're not the makers of uh, Guitar Hero, but we see this in the same pattern. You know, so uh, you have a game like Tower Blocks, where it originally came out back in 2005, and it uh, you know was on a uh, you know conventional Nokia 
uh, Series 40 phone. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be a game on that phone, you had to be, the fi entire file size of the game was 65,000 kilobytes. That's all you got. Mm -hmm. And that same game has gotten a bigger and bigger audience every year since then. Yeah. And it's gotten onto more and more platforms. And you know, it's probably been played 100 million times on the web. It uh, went to Facebook, and it was one of the top 40 applications out of 40,000. It went to the iPhone. It went to number one in the App Store. And you know, you'd think that a humble little game in 65,000 bytes on a, on a uh, you know, 2005 cell phone wouldn't have that kind of staying power. But, it, but I think this part of the irony is that all along, we were thinking, we're designing for everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's going to have one of these devices. So we've got to design for them. And they're going to want to be able to do it with one touch. And it's going to have to be really simple. And the play session is going to have to be really short. And you're going to have to be able to do something interesting that is kind of intuitive and rewarding, but you know, not involve a lot of overhead. So in Tower Blocks, you're able to build a skyscraper just by tapping the same, just hit the screen in the same place all the time. And you build this marvelous uh, skyscraper, skyscraper. And then another big game uh, for us right now uh, that's done this, had the same pattern over the years is Roller Coaster Rush. And you know, it's, it's a hit on the iPhone right now. It was a big hit on the web. Mm -hmm. And all you do with that game is you have the experience of being on a roller coaster. And all you need to do is tilt the phone. That's it. <laughs> and of course, what most people do is like to speed up. You tilt it this way. So everyone's, everyone's <laughs> just, you, know, you watch people playing it. And they got this, this thing all the way over. <clears throat> you know, they want to go fast. Uh -huh. But it, you know, just keep it really simple. And I think particularly for interactive uh, technologies like we have, um, that's especially crucial because if it looks complicated, people are going to stay away from it. Yeah. And by the way, I just, uh, you just were talking about two of your most popular games, just to know, like, what are a couple of things that are the most popular, best? Uh, this is such a funny for, for group here. Uh, I know, it's like, it's like, it's like <laughs> our most popular product is One World that, that does multi-company consolidation in a go. single instance of NetSuite. <laughs> you shake it, it's like a roller coaster when you, <laughs> and when you if your numbers are going up, uh, you that's grab brilliant. the database and you shake it and the world gets screwed yeah, up. Yeah, that's and, better than a Sanskrit <laughs> project right there. That, that could and, work. And lately business results are like looking at yeah, a roller coaster. Exactly. Hopefully like they're that. all going up. <laughs> you never don't get the downside of the roller coaster is the hope, unless those are expenses, in which case that's fine. Um, no, but One World's the big, the big product. And really, the, you know, and I think the other thing, you know, just sort of to bring it back to One World to, to the topic at hand is that, you know, the, the early days when a new disruptive technology, whether it be a phone or the internet come along, people try to repurpose the old stuff. Mm -hmm. And the cool stuff is the things that couldn't have been done with the old stuff anyway. And One World's one of those kinds of products, right, where you couldn't consolidate all of your countries in a single instance of the product because the network wasn't there and the architecture wasn't there and the internet wasn't there and all those things. So, um, uh, you know, those are the interesting, the interesting things. And again, in these complex business applications, you know, everybody's, everybody else's business seems easier than your own, right? So, um, but in complex business applications, it's, uh, it's this discussion of convenience versus fidelity is a very interesting topic. But and I, when I was reading Kevin's book, you, you, and you will read the book and you'll have the same thing, you'll think about your company and you go, oh, I'm convenient and I'm high fidelity. And then you go to chapter three. If you think you're convenient and high fidelity, you are a dead company. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, hold it. No, I'm not. No, no. It's the fidelity mirage or something. You basically, but I think at certain stages of evolution or depending on where you are in the market, you know, we're obviously much more convenient than SAP, and we're much more high, much higher fidelity than QuickBooks. You know, so there is some segmentation of the marketplace that comes into play, and different customers buy for different aspects of the convenience factor, or the fidelity factor. Um, but that's just a warning when you read the book. I probably just ruined it for you. That was probably the big surprise. <laughs> yeah, my big. Yeah, I was going to unveil that. <laughs> Uh, let, let me ask you both um, one, one last quick question, and then we can open it up to, um, to every, everybody else. Um, if you were uh, going to start a brand new company in your industry, what would you do? I would actually do exactly what Digital Chocolate is doing now as kind of our leading, leading edge, which is uh, a, a particular model of uh, social gaming. Mm -hmm. And... It, uh, it actually includes a few new dimensions that, again, fuel this uh, argument about convenience. There's a lot of people on Facebook that don't want to give you a credit card. Mm -hmm. And if they're looking at an impulse activity and it has some financial value to them, it's probably not worth, you know, in terms of the lift to drag, it's not worth it to take the time to fill out a, a credit card thing or to expose the uh, you know, risk of uh, telling the wrong person your 
your credit card. So what's developed in that environment is a, a, another way of uh, monetizing that customer, which is called an offer completion network. And you know, this is a fairly uh, recent invention. Which is? So basically, imagine a recommendation engine that uh, watches what a customer is doing, and then, okay, that customer wants some, some financial value to be able to do something, say, in a game, but they're not going to give you a credit card. Instead, they're going to fill out an offer. Mm -hmm. And it could be agreeing to install somebody else's application. It could be filling out a market research survey that allows a company with an enormous ad budget to better target their advertising, uh, or it could be lead generation, you know, where uh, you know, a company like Netflix wants more subscribers, and so if you're willing to become a free trial subscriber, they'll pay for that, you mm -hmm. know, on a, on a sort of cost per acquisition basis. So that's that, that's developed. You know, so Facebook's fairly new. This whole idea of offer completion is fairly new, and and uh, th th there are some companies now having a lot of success with very simple, very casual. Uh, games that are designed more for social engagement with your friends and so on, and, and uh, not depending on whether or not you can get the credit card. Mm -hmm. And this, this, uh, this whole thing about convenient billing, this is a big deal. I mean, uh, that's one thing about Apple. It's a big advantage for them is mm -hmm. Apple is so cool that they say, this is a dumb piece of metal unless you set up a billing relationship, and we're not going to let you do anything with it until you give us your credit card. And people go, OK. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, I, I actually think almost every company should do that. Because see, once that customer gets launched with the product and they don't have the billing, they frequently never get around to doing it because it's inconvenient. And the, that lift to drag ratio is always slightly off. And that, that is one thing now with uh, Facebook is they've managed to get around that because offer completion is providing an alternative way of making money. Okay. So you start like games that were based on being able to... Yeah, because that's really kind of uh, the, 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 the new frontier of gaming is going to platforms like Facebook with, you know, they have over 300 million members now. Yeah. Unbelievable. And you know, if, if you've got a, a, a way of uh, conveniently engaging with those customers on that kind of scale and generating revenue without anybody having to give you a credit card, that's, that's a pretty remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in our case, we have uh, a special invention uh, to accompany that with, uh, which we call NanoStars. And uh, the, uh, the concept of virtual items now in games is becoming extremely popular. Yeah, and right. this it's is the idea that you can play the game for free, but then you want a better sword or a better uh, engine in your car or a better gun or, or, or something like that, and that's a virtual item, and you need to use virtual currency to buy it, and that's why you filled out the offer to get some virtual currency, you can get that better sword. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the idea of NanoStars is that instead of giving you a sword, we'll give you a character, like we, we'll, we'll sell you a Robin Hood, and that Robin Hood will actually have a living, breathing, uh, emotional life, and you'll have a relationship with it. And there will be a, a whole suite of different games, and Robin will actually transform and do different things in different games. Mm -hmm. So he might, he might be uh, an archer in an army in one game. He might be a spy in another game. He might be a, a magic sword or a magic arrow uh, in another game. <clears throat> so it's more of a platform play, and you know, it's, it's a way of uh, just, just getting a higher level of emotional engagement around uh, the virtual items. Okay. And so that means you, you guys should actually offer nano stars for NetSuite. Well, no, I like I mean, this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you can't use NetSuite until you start billing through us. I'm going <laughs> to set that up. That's a, that's a good way to get into that transaction stream. Thank you very much. That's a new, <laughs> new idea. No, so for, you know, you know me. Uh, this, I'm, this is sort of my passion is NetSuite, and I can't really imagine. I tried to think of one while Trip was going on and on and on there <laughs> about it. Something else I would want to do, and I absolutely couldn't, but it was good stuff. <laughs> I absolutely could not figure out anything else I'd want to do. And part of the reason is I get, you know, I get to see 6,600 other people's ideas and how they grow their business. I, I could never have those ideas. Especially when you're talking about the small to mid-market, people do the craziest stuff and make crazy amounts of money. Mm -hmm. And it's more fun for me to watch them and help them realize their dream than for me to go have a second dream about what I might be able to do. So, um, so that's, I'm pretty happy right where I am. Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, give you, you folks a chance to um, ask any questions.